Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. Fresh Wind, 
This is my friend John Kirkhoff playing bass and his daughter Annika at the back running the computer. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. We hope that you're worshiping at home and that you're getting your heart ready to receive from God's word today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for bringing us here today. And Father, for the presence of your spirit uh, with us here and with those who are watching in their homes, Lord God. I pray a special blessing on them today that their hearts would be open wide to receive everything that you have. Father, I pray that your anointing rests upon us uh, as we worship today. Lord, as I bring forth your word, may you be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
we just take a moment today and thank Jesus for what he's Amen. done on the cross. Yes, thank Lord. you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being willing to come and lay down your life so that our sins could be forgiven. We can never repay that debt. Right. All we can do is offer you our lives and we ask God that you would use us to build your kingdom here and to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, 
and it's called Waymaker. Father, we thank you. 
Your word teaches that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And you worked incredible, incredible miracles in the past. And that means that you do it today. We thank you, God. Father, I ask that you would work a miracle on this planet. Yes, Lord. God, and wipe this virus from the face of the earth. It is not beyond you, God. We ask you to do it, Lord. Father, we pray for those who are suffering, not only from this virus, but from other diseases and ailments, Lord, people in our own congregation. God, that you would touch them. We pray for Marlene today, God, who fell and cracked her wrist, and I pray, God, that your healing touch would be on her. Pray for Sheila, Lord, as she is facing uh, knee replacement surgery in just a few weeks' time. God, touch her, I pray. Bring healing to her body. We think of the many other needs, God, that are represented. We ask that you would undertake and meet them, Lord. We pray, God, for all of those people who are at the front of this uh, crisis, mm -hmm. that you would touch them and that they would see your hand working, Lord, and that you would protect them. Father, I pray that you would bring uh, a calm and a quiet to all these protests, God, around the world and let the peace of Christ reign. We pray, God, for our leaders and for wisdom for them, Lord, and bless them. I ask, God, that you would bring your anointing upon me in just a few moments as I open your word. Yes, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. Use your servant, I pray. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and the Lord bless you. Take a moment, watch our announcements this morning. Hi, my name is Jason Gilbert, and I'm the lead pastor here at Fresh Wind, and I am so grateful that you decided to join us today. These are your announcements for Sunday, June 7th. Hey everyone, you can check out our website at freshwindchurch.net, where you can find links to the latest Sunday sermon. You can find our social media accounts through Instagram and Facebook, and you can find out all the information related to Fresh Wind Church. We love you, and we're here for you. You belong here. The Bible teaches that our whole life needs to be a life of worship. Worship is more than just music. It is a complete lifestyle. And one of the ways that we worship and express gratitude to the Lord is through the giving of tithes and offerings. We have a couple of convenient ways that you can do that. You can send your tithe in by mail at Fresh Wind Revival Center, 21 Lloyd Street, Wingham, Ontario, N0G2W0. You can also e-transfer your tithe and your offering or your gift. FWRCDonation at gmail.com. Thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord. Hey guys, I just want to let you know that on Sunday morning, there is a kids' church on our Facebook page. Make sure to check that out. Yeah! Bible study on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Following the Bible study, there will be a Zoom prayer meeting at 7.50. So email this email if you want to be included. I would like to invite you to join my dad for Tuesday night Bible studies on Tuesday at... What? <laughs> I would like to invite you to join my dad for Bible study on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Following the Bible study, there will be a Zoom prayer meeting. <laughs> there is me. Hey everyone, you can check out our website at freshwind.net. Hey everybody, my name is Pastor Jason and I'm the lead plaster. <laughs> <laughs> there were lots of them this week. Um, amen. Well, if you have your Bible handy or your device, you can go ahead and turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. And I hope that you had an opportunity yesterday to uh, 
download the message, the message notes for today and uh, that you were able to print those and you can follow along there. Also check out our website, it's freshmanchurch.net. Um, that is where the, you can get the message notes, you can watch uh, the latest message and find out all the information that you need. Um, we're bringing a, a conclusion to this uh, series that we've been on. We've been uh, taking the Lord's Prayer, the, the Lord's model prayer, we're taking it apart piece by piece to see uh, six components of prayer that are vital for our prayer life. Uh, and so far we've discovered that we are to pray, first of all, that God's name be treated as holy in the earth. Okay, that's something that we should be praying about. Second, we are to pray that God's kingdom come to earth. Third, we're, we're to pray that we are able to surrender to the will of God. Fourthly, that we're to pray that we depend on and trust God to meet every need in our lives. Uh, and we discovered that the word bread, it, it, it talks about the basic necessities of life, you know, physical needs, emotional needs, relational needs, and also spiritual needs. And God has provision uh, for every one of those in your life. And then uh, we talked about that how we have to ask God to forgive us of our sins on a regular basis and that we are willing to forgive everybody who has sinned against us and hurt us in the past. And the Bible very clearly states that if we want God's forgiveness in our lives, we have to forgive everybody else. So we come to the last part of this today. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. And it says, And lead us not into temptation." but deliver us from the evil one. So basically this is a prayer for protection. When we pray, we're to depend on God to protect us. Protect us from what? From evil, specifically the evil one. And of course that's a reference to the devil, Satan. Now this is strange wording, and, and I want to address this. Why would the Lord ask us to pray that he would not lead us into temptation? Every human, as you know, you and I, we get tempted on a regular basis. We get tempted to do wrong things all the time. And God never tempts us. Temptation comes from the evil one. I want to submit perhaps it could be worded like this. Our Father, when I am tempted... Please deliver me from the evil one. And it all leads me to make a few observations today before we dive into the bulk of what I want to bring you today. The first observation is this. We are in an unseen spiritual war. The enemy of our souls uh, wars against the Lord in a huge invisible battle and we are in the midst of it whether we realize it or not. <laughs> the enemy knows that he cannot injure God. So his only recourse in this battle is to come against God's people, God's children. You need to realize that you are in a spiritual war. And you will be until God calls you home. And secondly, since we're in a war, I must know my real enemy. One of the reasons people walk around defeated and discouraged is because they don't know who their real enemy is. You often think that your enemy is other people. I mean, we all have people in our lives that just drive us bonkers. You do and I do. But that's not the real enemy. We often think the enemy is the economy. Or that the enemy is a political party. Or that the enemy is the virus. But who is the real enemy? Who is responsible for all the mess in the world? Who is responsible for the mess in our culture? Some of us would say, well, it's the Liberal Party. Some of us would say it's the Conservative Party. And if we say that, we're wrong. Look at what the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 6. And if you want to turn there, you can. Ephesians 6, verse 12. 
For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against uh, evil spirits in the heavenly places. Our struggle is not against people. It is against Satan and his dark forces. And without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are no match for him. It would be like trying to shoot a, a battleship with a rubber band. Now the devil uses people, and sometimes he can even use Christian people if they let him. Sometimes we say things that Satan puts into our minds. He has access to our minds. All of us uh, have bad, thought bad things, we've said bad things, we've done bad things that have gone against God. Not everything that is spiritual is good. There is an evil side to spirituality. Uh, there is such a thing as spiritual wickedness. There are churches today that operate under the influence of unclean spirits. There is light and there is darkness. There is righteousness and there is evil. And just because someone says I'm spiritual doesn't mean that they're good. There's evil spiritual forces too. And by the way, you also need to know that Satan doesn't fight fair. A lot of times he's going to put ideas into your mind and you've got to catch him in the act. He attacks you in your mind. Those thoughts of depression, those thoughts of discouragement, those thoughts of anger and fear and worry, they don't come from God. They come from the evil one. And they're going to come at you. And you need to understand this. And you need to catch him in the act. And that leads me to the third observation this morning. I must prepare for battle. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one is a prayer of protection. And thankfully, God gives us tools to help us. It is called the armor of God. The armor of God. And when we put these spiritual tools into effect in our lives, then we live in the protection of God. So today I'm going to be talking about the armor of God and what that all means. And it's found in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 13 says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. God wants you to stand. He wants you to walk and live in victory. But you're going to have to put on every piece of God's armor to resist the enemy so that you're still standing after all of these things have happened. Now I want to give you a little bit of a background here. When Paul writes the letter to the Ephesian church, he's imprisoned. And at this time, he was, the, he was the most famous prisoner in Rome. The Roman Empire is spread throughout all of uh, Asia and Europe, and Paul has been taken as a prisoner to appeal to Caesar. And not only was Paul in prison, he was chained 24 hours a day to a Roman centurion. So picture this. As Paul is writing this letter, He's chained to a Roman centurion, and he's writing on how to handle spiritual warfare, and he's chained to a fully dressed centurion, and he goes, hmm, I think I can use this as a teaching lesson, and that's exactly what he did. And he took every piece of that soldier's armor and made a spiritual parallel to the things that we need in our lives to guard against the attacks of the enemy of our souls. There's six pieces. I want to go through this today. And you need to put these on every single day of your life. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. First of all, the belt of truth. All right, I wanted to have a picture of a Roman soldier and what they might have looked like, but I couldn't find one that looked really any good. So you're going to have to use your imagination. You've seen those old movies, maybe like Ben-Hur or whatever, where you see Roman soldiers. Underneath the armor... The, the Roman soldier would, would, would wear a red tunic. That's the undergarment. 
The armor would go on over that. And the first item of armor that the Roman soldier would put on would be the belt. They would put it around their waist and tighten it up and it would give the soldiers support and stability. It's what held them together. The belt would not only strengthen his core, it would hold all of his weapons that he would use in battle as well. And Paul makes a parallel for us as Christians. He said that we need to wear a belt in our spiritual armor, and this belt is truth. We need to put on truth. Ephesians 6 verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The belt of truth gives your life stability. It gives your life strength. And if your life is not based on the truth, then you're going to have sinking sand and shifting sand, and you'll have no strong core. By the way, what is the truth? The word of God is the truth. The words of Jesus are truth. Matthew chapter 7, during the Sermon on the Mount, in verses 24 through 27, Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on a rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So what does this belt represent? This is the key word that I want you to focus on. The word is integrity. Integrity. The belt of truth represents integrity. Integrity is knowing and doing truth. And the first thing that you as a believer need to put on in your spiritual armor is integrity. It is the belt of truth that holds everything together. If your life isn't based on truth, it's going to fall apart. You need integrity in every area of your life. You need moral integrity, relational integrity, financial integrity, sexual integrity. You need integrity in every area of your life. Now, integrity does not mean perfection. It doesn't mean that you're always going to do the right thing. If you have to be perfect to have integrity, nobody has it because nobody's perfect. Everybody slips. Everybody stumbles. Integrity comes from the word integer. It means unit of one. It means that you are the same way with everybody. You don't act one way at work and another way at church. You don't act one way at home and another way with your friends. Integrity means what you see is what you get. It means that I am exactly who I appear to be. And if you lack integrity in any area, you're going to be vulnerable. If you segment your life and you say, this is my church life, and this is my work life, and this is my, uh, my secret pornography life, or my secret alcohol life, and this is my friendship life, and this is my social life. If, if you're like that, you already lack integrity because you're not acting the same in all those areas. Integrity is not only knowing the truth, it is doing the truth. So that's the one that gives you stability. It holds you together in tough times. It gives you strength. The second piece of the armor of God is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. So this would be uh, the second piece of armor that a Roman soldier would put on. It would, it would have a breastplate that would cover his heart. The rest of the body armor would cover the other vital organs. No Roman soldier would go out to battle without the breastplate and body armor. The Apostle Paul uh, makes another parallel. Ephesians 6, 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So what's in your breast area or your chest area? Your heart. He's talking about protecting your heart here. What is righteousness? Righteousness is purity of heart. 
And so here's the key word that I want you to remember for this piece. Purity. Purity. The second piece of armor that you need to put in your put on your life is purity. And uh, you first put integrity on, knowing and doing the truth. And second, you need to put on purity, which means keeping my motives clean and having a pure heart. And that's what righteousness is. So when you put on the breastplate of righteousness, you're saying, God, I want to have a pure heart and pure motives. Here's a couple of verses. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. It says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Now, what does that mean? It's talking about being close to God. In other words, who can get close to God? And the answer is in verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol, or swear by what is false. Again, it doesn't mean perfection. A pure heart means that even when we do the wrong thing, we want to do the right thing. That's a pure heart. In Matthew 5, verse 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Only the pure in heart get to be close to God. You want to be blessed in your family, blessed in your business and in your finances, you've got to have a pure heart. God will not bless an impure heart. So you need to put on not just the belt of truth, which is integrity, but the breastplate of righteousness, which is purity. Is your heart pure? You don't have to have a lot of talent in life to succeed, but if you want God's blessing, then you need to have pure motives. And one of Satan's main methods of attack is with impurity. And the reason he wants to attack you with impurity is because if he can get his foot in the door, you're a goner. He's going to attack you with uh, moral impurity. Pornography, movies, books, songs. You know, if I were to tell you to go get a drink of water out of the gutter, None of you would go get a drink of water out of the gutter, right? So if that's the case, why do we allow all of that gutter material on TV and in the movies and in the books into our minds? Mind pollution is far worse than physical pollution. Your mind is all you've got. And when you allow impure things into your mind, it pollutes it. So many people, they say, well, you know, I can listen to that to that stuff, or I can read that stuff, doesn't bother me. That's the problem. It should bother me. If it doesn't bother me, it means my conscience is seared a little. If you don't have a pure heart, you're wide open to everything that the enemy wants to do to you, and his ultimate goal, his plan for your life, is to get you to turn away from God. You have to have integrity. The belt of truth. You got to have purity, which is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the third thing a Roman soldier would put on would be shoes. His shoes had hobnails on the bottom. They were little nails that were nailed in there to make their grip better, kind of like cleats. And the soldier needed these hobnails so that he didn't slip and slide all over the place. He needed to be able to take a stand and hold his ground. So he put on these hobnail shoes. The third piece of God's protective gear is this, the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. Paul says that this represents peace in your life. He calls these shoes the readiness of the gospel of peace, Ephesians 6, verse 15. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The word gospel, you know what that means, right? It means good news. So let's call these good news shoes. <laughs> the word readiness here indicates a readiness to share the good news. And a Roman soldier needed good footing to fight the battle. Now for you to stand spiritually so that you don't slip and slide, so that you don't stumble, so that you don't fall away, you're going to need the good news shoes prepared to share the gospel of peace. So what is he saying here? He's saying if you want to stand in life and be able to stand strong under the storms, you're going to have to be at peace. And he's talking here 
about relationships. There's three kinds of peace. There's peace with God, there's peace with myself, and then there's peace with everybody else. It's called reconciliation. Jesus called it the great commandment. Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So you make peace with God. You make peace with your neighbor. And you make peace with yourself. And if you have conflict in any of those areas, you leave the door open for the enemy to attack you. So where do I get this peace that gives me my solid ground? Well, here's the key word that I want you to think about here. Serenity. You need serenity. Serenity is living and speaking the gospel of peace. And if I'm going to get dressed for battle, I need integrity, I need purity, and I need serenity. Living in peace and speaking peace to other people. Let me ask you a question. All these images that you've seen this week of people around the world rioting, do those people have serenity? Do they have integrity? Do they have purity? There's a reason they're not at peace. They don't have the Prince of Peace. So how do I get the gospel of peace in my life? Psalm 119 verses 165 says, Great peace have they who love your law. That's the word of God. And nothing can make them stumble. The word law represents the word of God. Now, you're at home. I want you to do this. I want you to hold your Bible up high. Great peace you will have if you love this book. Because if you love this book, nothing will make you stumble. If I love God's word, that means that I am in it a lot. It means that it is alive inside of me. And it means that I will have firm footing. Now follow me with this. Satan is going to attack your integrity with lies. He's going to attack your purity with lust. He's going to attack your serenity with worry. Every time you worry, you slipped off the good news shoes. When you're worried, you're not at peace. And Satan can easily push you over because you've removed those shoes that keep your feet uh, firm-footed. The Bible teaches that we're to do two things with peace. We're to live it and we're to speak it. We're to live peacefully and we're to speak peacefully with everybody. Romans 12 verse 18 says, If it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. God wants you to be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. God wants you to build harmony, not conflict. If it is possible, and as far as it depends on you, you do everything that you can to be at peace with other people. And if people don't reciprocate, that's on them, not on you. It's called reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 20. It says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. God made peace with him possible through Jesus' death and resurrection. And when we get saved, our sins are not counted against us anymore. And now that we've been saved by God through Christ, we have now been sent to speak about this peace with God to as many people as we can that's what an ambassador is. One who is sent to speak on behalf of the one who sent them. You understand now why Paul calls peace shoes? When we go somewhere, we put on our shoes so that we can walk greater distances. As ambassadors of Christ, 
we have to put on the shoes of peace so that we can speak God's peace to everybody. And here's the problem. A lot of people are happy to live in peace, but not too many want to speak peace. They're happy to be at peace with God, but they're scared to death to speak to people about Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. A lot of times we have friends and neighbors who need to hear the good news of peace. We chicken out. And when we do that, we take the shoes of peace off. We have to speak up and we have to say what we live. That was the fourth piece of armor. Paul says that we need to arm ourselves with the shield of faith. Ephesians 6 verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So Roman soldiers would have a shield which was at least the same size as the soldier. The soldier in battle would use the shield to protect his whole body. In ancient warfare, they didn't have cannons and guns. They had bows and arrows. <laughs> and uh, they would light the end of an arrow on fire and then shoot it. The shield would catch the arrow and extinguish the flame. So what is the shield of faith? Here's what I want you to focus on. This is the word. It is certainty. The shield of faith is certainty. And it's the fourth piece of God's armor that you need to put on. Certainty is the shield of faith. Certainty is trusting the promises of God when everything is going wrong in my life. That's the shield of faith. I know what God has said, and he's going to help me through this, so I'm going to trust God when all of these arrows are coming at me. There was a bumper sticker years ago that said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You know what, that's almost right. It should say, God said it, God said it that settles it, whether I believe it or not. <laughs> what God says is true, whether I believe it or not. God cannot lie. And what God said in his word is truth, and it is truth, whether we believe it or not. What God says uh, about sex is true, whether you believe it or not. What God says about life is true, whether you believe it or not. What God says about money is true, whether you believe it or not. And when you put your faith in, in and put on the shield of faith, you have the certainty that God's promises are true even when it appears that they are not happening in your life at that moment. The Bible says that all these burning arrows come at you. The King James Version calls them fiery darts. What are the fiery darts that come at you? They're the things that Satan puts in your mind. Here's a couple of uh, things that he likes to attack us with. The first one is doubt. Did God really say that? Can you really trust God? Isn't that just your interpretation? Did God really mean that when he said that and he creates doubt in our lives? And then the second big one is discouragement. And you can think, well, I don't know why God has allowed this to happen to me. This isn't fair. And the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. You have to have the shield of faith and carry it with you. And have the attitude that you're going to trust God no matter what your feelings say. I'm going to trust God no matter what my eyes tell me. I'm going to trust God no matter what I'm hearing. And I'm going to hold on to the shield of faith. Fifth thing is this, the helmet of salvation. So the fifth piece of armor that the soldier would put on would be the helmet. Probably the most important piece of equipment that he wore. In battle, if you've got a head wound, that is often a mortal wound that claims your life. Even in modern warfare. I remember when I was in Bible college in Peterborough, there was a huge uh, army surplus store there. And I went in one time, and they had a section of uh, old uh, war helmets. And I remember picking one up and uh, marveling at the dents in the helmet from enemy bullets. That helmet protected that soldier from taking a bullet in the head. Ephesians 6 and verse 17 tells us, take the helmet 
of salvation. So why do soldiers, and you think about sports, even hockey players, football players, why do they wear a helmet? To protect their head. What's inside your head? Your brain. And your brain is where your mind is housed. And when Paul talks about putting on the, the helmet of salvation, he's talking about protecting your mind. And so the key word here is sanity. Sanity. The fifth piece of protection in God's armor is sanity. And sanity means that I protect my mind from evil thoughts. If you're going to win the battles in life, you need to learn how to control your thoughts. So what is it that protects my mind from evil? There's only one answer. Salvation. When I put on salvation, I get a whole new mind. I can say it this way. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if he's not your Lord and Savior, you have zero protection against the enemy. None whatsoever. Satan is not afraid of your words. He is afraid of God's word. He is not afraid of your thoughts. He's afraid of God's thoughts. And it is salvation that protects your mind. It's amazing what people allow into their minds. Colossians 3 verse 2 says, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. So when Satan shoots a dart of doubt in your mind, you can say, I'm not going to believe that. I've got the helmet of salvation on. I'm going to start thinking about how amazing God is. And you can choose what you think about. When you set your mind on things above, you're putting on the helmet of salvation. So when you think about each of these issues, integrity, purity, serenity, certainty, and sanity, you know what that is? That's the perfect picture of Jesus Christ. What this is talking about is letting Jesus Christ live through your life. Nobody has more integrity, purity, serenity, certainty, and sanity than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's one other thing that you need to have. Not only offers protection, but it gives you a weapon to fight against the enemy with. And Paul says you need to put on every piece. So here's the last one. The sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. And here's the key word that I want you to take from this. Maturity. Maturity. Am I talking about just knowing a lot of the Bible? No. It is knowing the Bible and knowing how to use the Bible against Satan. Maturity is the ability to use the Word of God against the enemy. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know how to do this. Hebrews chapter 5 Verse 12 down through 6, verse 1 says this. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and the faith in God. So the most important weapon that a Roman soldier could have was his sword. The sword is a weapon. Everything else is for protection. The other pieces you use to protect yourself while the enemy is coming after you. But when you have the sword, it means you're going after him. It means you're taking over territory. You're expanding. You're enlarging the kingdom. You're going after what you, what you want to go after. Not because you're just simply defending yourself like, like a poor person under attack. But you're saying, I'm coming after you, pal. You're not going to get my family seat. You're not going to get my job, Satan. You're not going to get my marriage, Satan. 
You're not going to get my mind, Satan. I'm coming after you. The Bible calls this the sword of the Spirit. Verse 17 says, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So take your Bible in your hand one more time and raise it high. This is your sword. The Bible is your sword. Now listen very closely. The Bible does not become your sword until you memorize it. If all the words are in this book and it is sitting on your shelf, it does you no good at all. But if you memorize a Bible verse, it's in your mind and it's in your arsenal whenever you need to use it. And when you take truth out of here and you put it in here, it becomes your sword. Jesus taught us how to fight temptation when he was in the wilderness, when Satan tempted him. And with every te temptation, he answers Satan's attack with a quote from the scripture. Satan says, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? And Jesus, modeling it for us, says, it says in the Bible not to do this. And when Jesus quoted scripture to Satan, he didn't pull out his pocket uh, New Testament. When Jesus said, I will, or when Satan said, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me, uh, Jesus didn't say, well, I know somewhere over here in Deuteronomy, no, wait a minute, hold on, maybe it was Maybe it was in Joshua. He just quoted it because the word of God was in him. Now I need to admit that Jesus did have an advantage because he is after all God. <laughs> but you can have the word in you as you memorize verses that are a help to you. And we need to memorize as many verses as we can because when we're tempted, we never have a Bible with us. You ever notice that? Do I need to memorize the whole Bible? No. But I memorize the verses that help me when I'm tempted. So if I have a problem with impatience, then I need to go home and, and open my Bible and look up and memorize some verses about impatience. If I have anger problems, I need to memorize some verses about anger. And the same is true in every area of temptation in your life. And once you have them all memorized, you have a sword at your disposal. To fight back. To fight back. Now I want to bring this to a close because I've kept you long enough. I want to wrap this up by answering two simple questions. First of all, how do I put on all this armor? The answer is through prayer. Through prayer. Prayer is the way that you put on the armor of God. You put on all these pieces by praying about them. You say, God, I need integrity in my life. I need to know your truth and I need to do your truth. God, I need purity in my life today. There's a lot of impure things out there and I don't want any impure thing in my life. God, I need serenity today. I need you to help me put on the, the shoes of the good news when I begin to worry and fret, God, please give me serenity. And God, when I begin to doubt, I need certainty. And God, in this crazy world when nothing makes sense anymore, I need sanity. And I ask you to protect my mind. And God, I need maturity. Help me to memorize your word and get it in me so that I have swords to use against the evil one. Ephesians 6, verse 18. It says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. We fight the battle in prayer. A lot of people don't get prayer. Many people feel that prayer is something you just tag on, like singing a national anthem before a game. You pray before you eat, you pray before you sleep, but, but prayer is how you fight the battle, and prayer is how you put the armor on. And that's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 gave us a model prayer so that he could teach us how to pray effectively. And the second thing, second question, when is the best time to put on the armor of God? Morning or evening? I'm going to say morning. Because when you get up in the morning, you need the armor to get you through your day. The second part of verse 18 says, with this in mind, be alert 
And always keep on praying for all the saints. You don't go through the whole process of putting on the armor at night because you need it to help you be alert. I want to encourage you to pray through the armor of God every single morning for yourself and help your family. So when you start dressing yourself through prayer and these six items every day, you have God's protection on you. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. That's how you get deliverance, by putting on the armor of God. That's how God delivers us from the evil one. Amen. Well, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. Maybe you're watching today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the most important decision you could ever make. You have an opportunity right now to make Jesus your Lord. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. Are you ready to make that confession? To say that Jesus is Lord, to believe that God raised him from the dead, Ask God to forgive you of your sin. Friend, I want to encourage you to do that right now. Just pray a prayer like this. Lord God, I know that I'm a sinner and that I have no hope without Jesus. I ask you, God, to forgive me of my sins. I confess with my mouth today for the first time, Jesus is Lord. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. And today I live my life, start living my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today and you meant it, friend, I want to be the first one to welcome you into the family of God. I want you to get in contact with me somehow through my email or, or through my phone. And uh, my email is pastorjason at curantel.on.ca. My cell number is 705-962-0611. I would love to talk to you and help you with your next steps. Or if you would like to have a prayer, I would be happy to take some time and pray with you. I want to thank you for joining us today. And I hope that this message and that this series on prayer has been a blessing to you and that it's been a help to you. Father, I just pray the peace of God over every person listening right now. May they sense your peace. Help us, God, in these six areas that we don't leave ourselves open and vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. You have told us what we need to do. Help us to do it. Give us the resolve that we need, God. Thank you for being with us today. And I ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for watching.